Well, good uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Today I learned on TikTok. I've uh, thought I'd take the opportunity of um, sneaking into the dude's studio when he's uh, when he's out working, um, mainly because I can help myself to his whiskey. I can't find his Johnny Walker red label that he's been on about, but I have managed to find a a very nice. Um, Singleton, so I think I'll uh, sneak a little bit of that before he gets back. But, uh, over there on Crunch Island, it'll be, well, it's quarter to nine here, so it'll be qu quarter to two in the afternoon on Crunch Island. So uh, I think I'm, I'm pretty safe. I don't expect him to be wandering in at any minute now. But I will have to have a search, as I say, for his... Johnny Walker red label. It must be around here somewhere. Anyway, um, things things to to quickly mention uh, before we go any further. Um, as you know, last week I had a chance to chat with a couple of guys. Hi there. Um, hi everybody. A chance to chat with a um, a couple of the hosts of Marathon. I haven't managed to get hold of all of them. Um, Hollywood, as he's known, is difficult to get hold of, but he does, does assure me once he's back that uh, he'll join me for a chat. Um, I had the huge pleasure um, the weekend before Mammothon on the Sunday, and this Sunday just passed, to have a um, be invited on to the Coffee with Foul Play, uh, which was great. Um, a great bunch of uh, researchers there. Um, a lot of, I think, just about everybody from Val Play was was involved in some way or, or another with Mammothon. Um, so anyway, I was invited to join them on the uh, on the chat there in a couple of their videos. The um, the one before Mammothon called Item FL, which looks very very closely at um, obviously the, the magic bullet. And then uh, on Sunday, I was um, invited back again, and the video, foul play video, was called Nothing to See Here. Um, foul player doing a great job. Um, I had to pay tribute to the fact that in less than less than a year, I think just about six months, they're virtually up to a thousand subscribers. So uh, they're they're doing a great a great job there. Hi there, Dr. Siltman. It was nice to nice to be on with you. Um, so yes, first of all, thanks for having me on the uh, um, the, the foul play videos. Um, next, I got a message from um, Brandon Meredith Maddox, and I just gonna very very quickly quickly do this because I think this is this is important. So they have a uh, an item of clothing for sale. So this is this is essential, obviously, for um, gigging musicians when they're not able to do gigs to be able to fund themselves in other ways. Um, and you heard the dude mention this uh, this song, "You Drive Me to Drink." Talking of which, yeah. Um, so please do head on over to the Brandon Maddox website Brandon Maddox music where you can order a t-shirt um, get all the details about it there okay so that's um, so that's that, that, that will help support um, Brandon and Meredith the other thing I wanted to share with you just before we get on to the um, Opinion of prosecutorial, prosecutorial immunity. Um, I'm definitely going to be tuning into this offering for Netflix. We've got a situation now whereby I, I, I think we can call it the, the, the MAM, the making a murderer effect. 
they've highlighted since making a murder come came out there have been so many cases uh documentaries i as i say i i, I keep a list of them i think i'm up to about 24 documentaries that uh, that have come out since making a murder that really do um sort of follow follow the main theme of there's something wrong with the legal system it's not working you're you're, you're getting loads of problems um and i mean this well it really does for me um on the head nail they have hit um i say that um murder to mercy the Sintoya brown story very interesting uh, that's exactly exactly how governor evers should be looking at um um brendan brendan's case um with his lawyers seeking clemency but yes coming out on i believe it's the 11th of this month yeah there we go coming season one coming on 11th of may and i thought this was interesting from executive producers george clooney and jeffrey tubin so um if you haven't already seen this hopefully this will work <laughs> I found out early on with a lawyer. It doesn't matter about the law. It's about <laughs> being able to tell the story. When you turn a courtroom into a studio, you have to turn reality into a story. It's good guys, bad guys, drama. You've got to come up with ways to become part of the new cycle. I'm not saying the trials are fair, but for the public opinion, it's very important. Because if everybody in the building likes these guys, they must be the good guys, right? <laughs> Nobody had committed murder as a result of being on a trash talk show. You use those people. That's not quite the way I see it. <laughs> I want to kill those guys. If it bleeds, it leaks. <laughs> He absolutely embraced the media's attention. You ain't seen nothing yet! The NYPD shot someone 41 times. The media didn't have any interest in discussing who he was. Everything was done for the purpose of ratings, and ratings are money. I really wasn't sure that what I was seeing was real. Stop the cameras. Let's, let's stop right here. Okay, so I think that's going to be um, very interesting um, documentary. Uh, of course, um, nowadays, of course, we have got um, that trial by media working uh, working the other way. Which is which is good. Putting the spotlight on um, Netflix, putting the spotlight on um, all these wrongful convictions. Um, so um, I think that's really all I wanted to cover um, as far as news events. Um, hopefully, um, I've not had it confirmed yet, but hopefully at the weekend, uh, myself and the dude will get together with. Um, rob if um if he's available rob bellin um also i've been chatting with a with a fellow uh, a good friend of mine that lives locally um we're hoping to put together in the not too distant future um an, an actual history of scotland from around about the the sort of 1700s um onwards um it's it's uh, a friend of mine a doctor that, that does this presentation and he's agreed to to do some slides and uh, come and join me and have a look at uh, scottish enlightenment as it was called which had a huge effect on uh, on obviously america and america's legal system um so yes yes Sharon, it's, it's it's very interesting in it and it deals with um it should deal with with a few other interesting things which, uh, which well anyway 
let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's uh, let's let's wait till we get to everything sorted out, and um, and, and we'll get uh, we'll get started on that one. So so um, as I say, I, for me, I look. I I don't think there is any doubt whatsoever. You know, I think we're past. You know, do we need do we need to prove that Steve and Brendan are, are innocent? Uh, so far, you know. Sukovic has procrastinated as best she can. It's now it's moved on from her. She's done her bit for the for the local community. She's she's been as as, as awkward as she could possibly be, you know. And maybe there are people in Wisconsin who think you know she's done a great job because she's you know done her best to uh, um, to try and um, prevent prevent justice. Um, obviously. The rest of the world think think very differently, um, but we're really past that. It's uh, it, it's time that uh, people involved in the, the wrongful convictions of Stephen Brendan they're really starting to to panic now. Uh, and, and if they're not, then they should be. So I think, as I say, we're past that. I think with things like the Innocence Files and, and a lot of the other documentaries that we've seen. The question is, well, how do you how do you make the system better? How, how do you get rid of, you know, the uh, the making a murderer documentaries type documentaries? How, how how do you how do you get a better system? I, you know, and listen, you know, as, as as we know, we're in I'm in Scotland. Look, it's we we have wrongful convictions here. Of course, you do. You you have them everywhere, um, particularly when when people get framed. Um, and in the case of, for example, Luke Mitchell, you know, trial by media is very, very much um, what happened to uh, to Luke Mitchell. So, I think one of the things that that we always always say is that we need to get rid of prosecutorial immunity. Um, so this this was this was an article that was written. Um, well, let, let's just go straight to it. Um, it, it, it'll be clear once once we go through the article, possibly in two or three parts, that um, it's it, th th this is looking particularly at not um, prosecutorial misconduct for which there are um, punishments, but this is this is the you know if you really want to make prosecutors change the way they behave, hit them in the pocket. So so this is this is prosecutorial in looking at prosecutorial immunity from the. From the fact that people taking out civil suits against prosecutors, which again has you know, um, overtones with regards to Stephen's case, but anyway, let's have a look at it and see what uh, see what this this article says. Um, hopefully, this will all work. So here we go. This is the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology. Fall of 2012. Someone, somebody help me understand this. The Supreme Court's interpretation of prosecutorial immunity and liability under Statute 1983. And this is written by Kate McClelland, and I would just like to point out this is from the Northwestern University. As it says here, scholarly commons law northwest university um recommended citation okay from um criminal law and criminology and this is saying 2013 but it was actually um the fall of 2012 when kate wrote down these opinions Okay, so Kate McLennan in her introduction says, on March 29th, 2011, the Supreme Court of the United States held in Connick versus Thompson that a district attorney's office could not be held liable under United States Supreme Court Statute 1983 for a single Brady violation by one of its prosecutors. The 5-4 decision split along ideological lines. The conservative branch of the court refused to hold a district attorney's office 
liable for what it saw as a single Brady violation by a lone rogue prosecutor. The liberal ring of the court interpreted, interpreted the facts differently and found egregious Brady violations that deprived the respondent of his constitutional rights. The case appalled commentators. In their opinion, the respondent clearly suffered an injustice at the hands of his prosecutors, and yet the court's opinion barely acknowledged his suffering and instead justified the de decision on questionable, if not downright flimsy grounds. One commentator went so far as to call the opinion one of the meanest Supreme Court decisions ever written. The case will have far reaching. I always like to guess what the next word is going to be. The case will have far reaching implications for prosecutorial accountability under Brady and the ability of criminal defendants to assert civil rights claims against prosecutors' office, offices under Statute 1983. Prior to the Supreme Court decision, respondent John Thompson, in discussing his conviction, said, they call it malfeasance of office and get a slap on the wrist while I'm up at Angola, the Louisiana State Penitentiary, on death row for 18 years. Somebody help me understand this. But practitioners and judges hardly have any clearer idea of what prosecutors can be punished for their misconduct. The court's current approach to prosecutorial liability under Statute 1983 is a mess. The decisions in this area of law have made it more difficult for defendants to prove violations of their constitutional rights while increasing the strength of prosecutors' immunity for their actions, both individually and collectively as an office. Even in cases like Connick, where everyone agrees that a constitutional violation occurred, no punishment results. Without enforcement, Brady and other rules designed to protect a defendant's rights are effectively negated. Currently, a former defendant bringing a Statute 1983 claim against a prosecutor's office must show a pattern of constitutional violations within the office that proves that, one, the district attorney failed to properly train his or her subordinates, and two, that failure to train directly caused the violations. But the court has never clearly defined what serious events in a prosecutor's office actually constitutes a pattern. In lieu of a pattern, some case law suggests that municipal liability for failure to train can result from a single incident if the need to train was so obvious that the municipal policymakers responsible for training were deliberately indifferent in not training their subordinates. However, Connick appears to reject the single incident liability approach, at least in the case of prosecutor's office. Now she goes on to say that part one of this comment will examine the Connick decision. This part will walk through the facts of John Thompson's original case, the procedural history of Connick itself, the majority's reasoning in Connick and the minority's counterpoints. Part two, will examine the Supreme Court's case law on prosecutorial immunity and municipal liability, pre precedent that ultimately shaped the Connick decision. Part three will discuss the problems with the rule established by Connick and the other cases. Part four will assess alternatives to requiring the Supreme Court to overhaul its precedent in this area, including stricter ethical sanctions for prosecutorial misconduct and internal structural reform of prosecutor's office. Finally, part five 
will argue that the Supreme Court should overrule its precedent, pre pre precedent, precedent, if you like, and adopt absolute immunity for prosecutors to put an end to the current confusion in the law. Well, look, we'll be interested to see what, what reasons Kate gives for this idea that they should um, give absolute immunity to prosecutors. I must admit, I had to read that bit several times to, to, to confirm that's what, what she was asking for. But anyway, let's have a look at the case itself. John Thompson spent 18 years in prison, 14 of them on death row for a crime he did not commit. He was charged with the murder of the son of a prominent New Orleans businessman in 1985. John Thompson's face covered the New Orleans press. A local father whose three minor children had been victims of a recent attempted armed robbery showed them a news newspaper and asked if Thompson was the man who had robbed them. They identified him as the attacker. Four prosecutors from the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office handled Thompson's two cases. Assistant District Attorney James Williams and Jerry Deegan were assigned to the armed robbery, while Williams and Eric Dubelia were assigned to the murder. Assistant District Attorney Bruce Whitaker approved the armed robbery indictment. Now, although Dubelia and Williams were two of the highest ranking attorneys in the office at the time, none of the prosecutors had even five years of experience as a prosecutor. Together, the prosecutors made the strategic decision to proceed with the armed robbery trial first. If Thompson were convicted of armed robbery prior to the murder trial, he would be vulnerable to impeachment if he took the stand in his defence at the murder trial. The armed robber left blood behind on the pant leg of one of his victims. A crime lad, lab technician took a scrub, swab of the blooded fabric from the pants and sent it to the crime lad lab one week before Thompson's armed robbery trial. Whitaker received the report from the crime lab and placed it on Williams's desk, but Williams denied ever seeing it in his later testimony at trial. Meanwhile, Deegan checked out all of the physical evidence in the case from the police property room on the first day of the trial, including the bloody swatch. But when he checked all of the evidence into the courthouse property room, the swatch was missing. Thompson's defence counsel never learned of its existence and Thompson was convicted of the armed robbery. Because of this conviction, he did not testify at his later murder trial and later in 1985, he was also convicted of first degree murder. Now, in 1994, Deegan was dying. He confessed to his friend and fellow prosecutor, Michael Relam, that he had hidden exculpatory blood evidence from Thompson's armed robbery trial. Wildman, I'm going to go with Wildman, did not tell anyone about this conversation for five years. In 1999, Thompson's private investigator, in a last-ditch effort to save his client from being executed, re-examined all of the prosecution's files on Thompson's cases. He uncovered the crime lab report on the blood evidence from the armed robbery. The robber's blood type was type B. Thompson is type O. When the new information came forward, a judge vacated the armed robbery conviction and in 2003, when he was retried for murder, Thompson was found not guilty. 
After his release from prison in 2003, John Thompson filed suit against the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office. District Attorney. <laughs> I like this. Harry Connick Sr. <laughs> now, <laughs> whether whether his son is Harry Connick Jr., we don't know, but I just love that name. So Harry Connick Sr., James Williams and others under United States Supreme Court Statute 1983. Thompson alleged that the defendants violated his constitutional rights under Brady by withholding the crime lab report. Thompson put forward two theories. First, he claimed that the district attorney's office had an unconstitutional Brady policy. In the alternative, he alleged that regardless of what Orleans Parish's official <clears throat> Brady policy was, the violation resulted from Connick's deliberate indifference to the need to train his subordinates in proper Brady procedure. In district court, the jury rejected the first claim, but agreed with Thompson that Tonic Connick was deliberately indifferent to the need to train. They awarded Thompson 14 million in damages, 1 million for each year that he was on death row. <clears throat> the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit sitting on bank divided evenly on the failure to train issue, thus upholding the district court judgment. The Supreme Court then granted certiorari to decide whether a district attorney's office may be held liable under statute 1983 for failure to train based on a single Brady violation. In a 5-4 decision, the court held that an office could not be held liable based on a single Brady violation. Well, at least uh, Kathleen Zellner, I think, has got six Brady violations coming forward. Anyway. Justice Thomas wrote the court's opinion. He reasoned that Thompson's claim could not succeed because he did not prove a pattern of violations that would indicate a failure to train prosecutors. Moreover, Thompson did not prove that a the single violation in his case was sufficient to give rise to liability. Consistent with precedent, the opinion stated that a pattern of similar constitutional violations by untrained employees is ordinarily necessary to just demonstrate deliberate, deliberate indifference for purposes of failure to train. Thompson stated, Thomas stated that Thompson did not try to prove a pattern, yet Thompson did reference four convictions from Orleans Parish that were overturned by Louisiana courts in the 10 years prior to his armed robbery trial due to the failure to disclose exculpatory evidence. Those cases, however, were not, quote, similar to the violation at issue in Thompson's case because the disputed evidence was not scientific like Thompson's blood evidence was. Well, I know what the dude would be saying. He would be calling it BS. And I would be saying it's interesting how they change the goalposts, <clears throat> move them when it suits them. The single Brady, Brady violation, violation at issue in the case was also not enough on its own to establish liability. In Canton versus Harris, the court hypothesized a situation in which specific legal training was so clearly needed that the failure to give employees that training would necessarily lead to constitutional violations. Here, Thomas reasoned, the assistant district attorneys already had the legal training that they needed. They had all received a law license, graduated from law school and passed the bar examination. Continuing education classes were readily available and they had the opportunity to learn on the job from their superiors who would circulate information about important cases and legal 
developments. Moreover, the attorneys were held to strict character and fitness standards and the ethical standards imposed by the legal community. Simply put, attorneys are trained in the law and equipped with the tools to interpret and apply legal principles, understand constitutional limits and exercise legal judgment. Given these factors, Connick had no reason to believe that his assistants needed any further training. Additionally, Thomas pointed out, all of the assistant district attorneys working on Thompson's case knew about the general rule of Brady versus Maryland. Thompson's arguments appeared to suggest that formal training was needed, but a lack of formal training was not the equivalent of the complete lack of legal training hypothesized in Harris. While addition and tr additional training might have helped for the prosecutors, the court held that a lack of such training was not enough to impose liability. Chapter two, the precedent that shaped Connick. Connick's reasoning is so convoluted because it combines two prior lines of Supreme Court case law. The first line of case cases present the first line of cases present in Connick deals with prosecutorial immunity. Those cases establish a functional test to determine whether prosecutors have absolute or qualified immunity for their actions. Prosecutors have absolute immunity for many of their actions, but when they have only qualified immunity, they may be liable under United States Supreme Court's Statute 1983, according to this statute. Every person who, under colour of any statute, ordinance, regulation, custom or usage. Of any state or territory of the District of Columbia, subjects or causes to be subjected, any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdic jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges or immunities secured by the Constitution and the laws shall be liable to the party injured in an action of law, suit in equity or other proper proceeding for redress. If a prosecutor with qualified immunity violates a defendant's constitutional rights and thereby statute 1983, the defendant may sue the municip municipality that employs the prosecutor for monetary damages to recon recom recompense the violation. The second line of the cases implicated in Connick deals with this municip municip municipal liability under statute 1983 municipalities municipalities oh dear oh dear cannot be held liable under statute 1983 under a respondent superior theory for 1983 to apply the Municipal, municipal, municipalities, official, I don't think I've got that right, Munis, munis municipalities, official, official policy must be the direct cause of the constitutional violation. A policy failing to properly train employees and directly causing a recurring pattern of constitutional violations demonstrates deliberate indifference on the part of the municipality and results in a 1983 liability. The plaintiff must show that the municipal policymakers chose a policy that failed to train the municipality's employees adequately. The policy amounted to deliberate indifference to citizens' constitutional rights. And three, the policy directly caused 
for a pattern of violations of constitutional rights. Alternatively, at least prior to Connick, a plaintiff could also show that a single action by a municipal employee was so egregious that it was obvious that the municipality was deliberately indifferent to the need to train that employee. The prosec prosecutorial immunity cases. The Supreme Court decided its first case on prosecutorial immunity, Imbler versus Patchman in 1976. In Imbler, the court established that functional test to determine whether absolute or qualified immunity should apply to a prosecutor. Section 1983 did not eliminate immunity. Immunities, well grounded in history and reason, including absolute immunity for prosecutors. The court cited various public policy reasons why prosecutors had been given absolute immunity at common law, which was still important. Prosecutors were quasi-judicial officers who, like judges, required protection from actions that were intimately associated with the judicial phase of the criminal process. Moreover, the possibility of professional discipline for ethical violations served as a check on their behavior. Hmm. I can't help but disagree with that. The possibility of professional discipline for ethical violations served as a check on their behavior. Well, unless you're going to have, you know, Moira Ricard, Laura Ricardi and Moira Demos making a documentary about every single case, then these prosecutors, certainly in Steve's case, they had no, never in their, their worst nightmares did they ever think Never did they ever think that they were going to be found out. However, the court stated explicitly that it was not considering whether like or similar reasons require immunity for those aspects of the prosecutor's responsibility that cast him in the role of administrator or investigative officer rather than that of advocate. Determining whether a prosecutor was protected by absolute immunity thus depended on the nature of the role he was engaged in when the alleged violation took place. If the prosecutor was acting as an advocate, initiating a prosecution and presenting the state's case, he received absolute immunity. The court reserved the question of what type of immunity applied when the prosecutor was functioning as an investigator or an administrator. Burns versus Reed partly addressed this question by holding that prosecutors acting in an investigative capacity were only entitled to qualified immunity. The Supreme Court held that a, prosecute, that a prosecutor has immunity for her actions during a prob probable cause, probable cause hearing because she is acting in her role as advocate for the state. When a prosecutor advises the police about what investigative techniques they are able to use to obtain evidence, however, only qualified immunity protects her. The court rejected the idea that under the common law, this advice would have been protected too. Protected activity needed a sufficient link to the court proceeding because the concern with litigation in our immunity cases is not merely a generalized concern with interference with an official's duties, but rather is a concern with interference with the conduct closely related to the judicial process. While the court acknowledged that almost any purely investigative activity could be linked to the decision to prosecute, the protection of absolute immunity only extended to actions ultimately associated with the judicial process. Buckley versus Fitzsimmons further clarified the limits of advocacy as opposed to investigation. The Supreme Court found that the prosecutors were acted, 
were acting in an investigative capacity when they had expert after expert ex assess the evidence in the case until they found one whose testimony aligned with their theory of the case. The court appeared to establish a new bright line rule. A prosecutor neither is nor should consider himself to be an advocate before he has probable cause to have anyone arrested. The majority appeared to be saying that the advocacy function and thus absolute immunity does not take hold until after a finding of probable cause. As to the press conference that was held in conjunction with the defendant's indictment, the court noted that at common law, prosecutors had immunity for defamation that occurred as a part of judicial proceedings, but not for out of court statements. Moreover, the conduct of a press conference is unrelated to a prosecutor's duties as an advocate. A prosecutor is no different, is in no different position than other executive officials who deal with the press and qualified immunity, qualified immunity is the norm for them. In Kalina versus Fletcher, a unanimous Supreme Court ruled that a prosecutor was entitled to only qualified immunity when she executed the certification required by local court rule that required that she essentially act as a complaining witness and swear to the facts alleged as the basis for probable cause and the is issuance of an arrest warrant. The preparation and filing of such a certification fell under the advocacy function but the prosecutor was performing the function of a complaining witness when she made false statements of fact in the certification under penalty of perjury. The court emphasized that testifying about facts is the function of the witness, not of the lawyer. In Vanderkamp versus Goldstein, the final case in this line prior to Connick, a unanimous Supreme Court described for the first time what a prosecutor's administrative functions might look like. The court held that the training, supervision and information system management at issue were administrative functions, but they were nonetheless directly related to the conduct of the trial and therefore entitled to absolute immunity. The functions at issue necessarily required legal knowledge and the exercise of related discretion. The court cited Imbler's public policy concerns, particularly the chilling effect that liability would have. Um, as I say, I can't help thinking when she talks about the chilling effect, you know, this, this, this opinion was obviously written, as I say, 2012, published 2013. 2016 before making a murder comes along i would like to see a lot more chilling effect on some of these prosecutors and maybe then they uh, you know you wouldn't have the uh, the innocence project um, trying to trying to get so many people innocent victims trying to get them um, released from their wrongful conviction but yeah let's, okay let's do that again since decisions without indictment or trial prosecution will often involve more than one prosecutor within an office. Multiple prosecutors could be liable under qualified immunity for the types of decisions at issue in Van der Kamp. If many prosecutors were liable for these decisions, then they would behave differently because the risk of liability might lessen their willingness to prosecute. Well, you know, that's exactly what you want. You know, don't just prosecute just for the sake of it. The Supreme Court began in Imbler with a functional test that seemed clear and simple to apply. With each subsequent case, the court chipped away at the advocacy, um, invest advocatory, investigative and administrative distinctions. After Van der Kamp, the court had determined that so many prosecutorial functions were intimately associated with the conduct of the trial that the functional test had lost its meaning.
The municipal liability cases. The future to train concept. The failure to train concept of Van der Kamp came from the line of cases relating to municipal liability that was developing alongside the prosecutorial immunity cases. The first case in this line is Monell versus Department of Social Services of the City of New York. In Monell, the court overruled an earlier case, Monroe versus Pape, which held that municipal municipalities municipalities yeah were wholly immune from liability under 1983 delving into the legislative history of statute 1983 the court determined that municipalities could face liability if official municipal policy had some of some nature caused a constitutional tort. However, municipalities could not be held liable just because they employed someone who committed a constitutional tort. That is, respondent superior did not apply. The municipality's policy or custom had to be the moving force or direct course of the violation. In the next three cases in this line, Oklahoma City versus Tuttle, Pemba versus Cincinnati, and City of Lewis versus Raptronic, Raptronic, the court was often badly divided on reasoning. These three cases failed to qualify the holding of Manel either by defining the terms official policy and policymaker for the purpose of determining liability or by explaining how to show that a particular policy directly caused constitutional violations. Instead, as the Second Circuit notes in Walker versus City of New York, the combination of total Pemba and pro pro, pro Prey proton, pre pro, oh, I gotta give up. Pro, protonic, pro protonic necessarily molds many 1983 claims against municipalities into failure to train or failure to supervise claims. It is only by casting claims in this way that plaintiffs can link an actual decision by a high level municipal agent to the challenged incident. This is why prosecutor, prosecutorial liability cases like Connick and Van der Kamp eventually became framed as 1983 cases alleging that a district attorney failed to train his subordinates properly. This group of cases requires plaintiffs to plead their claims as constitutional violations resulting from a high level municipal policymaker in order to succeed in a 1983 action. Justice Rehnquist's opinion in Oklahoma City versus Tuttle found a single incident of the use of excessive force by a police officer insufficient to prove a failure to train. There had to be some additional evidence to show that policymakers deliberately chose a training program which would prove inadequate. Pemba versus Cincinnati clarified that it was still possible for a single act to give rise to liability, but only if it resulted from the decision of a municipal policymaker. A plurality of the court found that the police had acted pursuant to the direction of the county prosecutor in executing an arrest warrant. The county prosecutor who was acting as county policymaker and the county could therefore be held liable. The plural, plurality suggested that the proper definition of a policymaker was the decision maker who possesses final authority to establish municipal policy with respect to the action ordered. Again, in City of St. Louis versus Pray Pro. Propotnik, yeah, that's, that's about it, Propotnik, 
I'll go with that, Propotnik. A plurality of the court reaffirmed that state law decides who the policymaker is. Justice Brennan's concurrence indicated that state law was a starting point, but that the fact finder should determine where policymaking power actually lay. Yet the plurality concluded that even when the policymaker delegated decisions to subordinates, the municipality could be held liable. The following year, in Canton versus Harris, the Supreme Court specified that a municipal policymaker had to show deliberate indifference to the need to train his subordinates for the court to find liability under 1983. The court found that the city's overall policy regarding the medical treatment of persons in custody to be constitutional. It determined that the city could not be liable for an unconstitutional application of the policy that was caused by a failure to train. The court held that the inadequacy of police training may serve as the basis for 1983 liability only when the failure to train amounts to deliberate indifference to the rights of persons with whom the police come into conduct. Additionally, only where deliberate indifference to the need to train was the moving force behind the constitutional violation is the municipality liable. One officer's unsatisfactory response to a situation is not necessarily a failure to train. However, in dicta, the court explored the possibility of a situation where the need for more or different training was so obvious that the policymakers of the city can reasonably be said to have been deliberately indifferent to the need. The obvious, the obvious need for training plus a single in incident of misconduct by a municipal actor could result in a constitutional violation that would be actionable under 1983 in at least one instance. City policymakers know to a moral certainty that their police officers will be required to arrest fleeing felons. The city has armed its officers with firearms in part to allow them to accomplish this task. Thus, the need to train officers in the constitutional limit limitations of the use of deadly force can be said to be so obvious that failure to do so could properly be characterized as deliberate indifference to constitutional rights. In other words, if one police officer, untrained in the constitutional limits of deadly force, were to shoot a fleeing suspect in contravention of Tennessee versus Garner, that single incident would be enough to give rise to municipal liability under 1983. Justice O'Connor's concurrence in Harris also introduced the idea of a pattern of constitutional violations for the first time in Supreme Court jurisprudence. She argued that repeated constitutional violations by a municip mun municipality's employees would put the municipality on notice that its officers confront the particular situation on a regular basis and that they often react in a manner contrary to constitutional requirements. She noted that lower courts that had adopted the deliberate indifference requirement often used a pattern of violations to infer that deliberate indifference was present. The pattern required advocated the pattern requirement advocated by O'Connor and the lower courts eventually became an official requirement for proving deliberate indifference in Board of County Commissioners of Bryan County versus Brown. Bryan County considered a 1983 claim resulting from a traffic cop where a police officer forcibly removed a passenger from a vehicle. resulting in injuries. The court held that the county was not liable under 1983 for the sheriff's single decision to hire the officer who injured the respondent. Despite the officer's violent history. This is reminding me of uh, 50 million dollar bullet. The hiring decision 
which was legal and constitutional, was not the moving force or direct course of the injuries. To find deliberate indifference and hold the sheriff liable, the respondent could not just show that there was some probability that an improperly reviewed hire would inflict an injury. She had to show that this officer was highly likely to inflict the particularly in, particular injured injury suffered by the plaintiff. Despite this officer's alleged allegedly violent background, it was not plainly obvious to the sheriff when he hired the officer that his history would result in constitutional violations. Deliberate indifference by the sheriff could have been proved by either a continued adherence to an approach that he knew or should have known has failed to prevent tortious conduct by employees or the existence of a pattern of tortious conduct by inadequately trained employees that is the moving force behind the plaintiff's injury. The court showed that it would be very reluctant to use a single indictment analysis to hold municipalities liable under 1983 without a very explicit casual connection between the single incident or single bad decision and the constitutional violation. Tuttle, Pembauer and Paprotnik framed municipal liability in terms of failure to train claims. O'Connor's concurrence in Harris and the opinion in Byron, Bryan County established the necessity of a pattern of constitutional violations in order to prove a failure to train. But Harris raised the possibility of single indictment liability in cases of truly egregious constitutional violations. These two alternatives for establishing municipal liability under 1983 set the stage for Connick versus Thompson. So I kind of suspected that would be where we would get to. So we'll, so we'll carry on with uh, part three at a later date. Um, I'm, I do apologize for having so, <laughs> so much trouble with some of those words. Um, but yeah, it, interesting stuff. Um, it'll be interesting to, um, to find other, other opinions of uh, what should happen with regards to prosecutorial immunity. Um, obviously, what was interesting, um, and I don't know how much we'll be able to ask uh, Rob Bellin about it, but in the case of Ken Kratz's sexting scandal, uh, he eventually had to uh, obviously hire Rob Bellin to try and help him in that particular civil suit um, brought by the, the lawyers for um, the, the victim, um, Stephanie Van Gogh. And eventually it was settled out of court. But of course, um, Ken Kratz fought all the way. Um, interesting, of course, that it was William Griesbach that said, no, you don't, uh, you don't have any, any immunity as a prosecutor for what you did in that particular case. Um, so anyway, let's, um, oh, thank you. Thank you, Crockett. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll try and try and get the teeth working again. I, I, I don't know whether it's lack of whiskey. It prob probably is probably a lack of, lack of this stuff. As I say, what, what I do find interesting is that when we get to the end of the the actual article, the idea is that you know we need prosecutorial immunity, so so that we don't have this chilling effect whereby prosecutors are are worried about going out and and prosecuting people left, right, and centre when they're when they're clearly in, innocent. Um, I mean, you know, it's not exactly a uh, it's it's bit of a no-brainer really isn't it you know you, you don't want these prosecutors carrying on as they're doing with with absolute immunity whereby you know withholding evidence um as i say let's 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 hope that things things do change um i can't help thinking that netflix's efforts are going to make a huge difference i mean i've as i say i've already spoken to uh prospective pupils who think thinking about going 
over <laughs> over to you know um, you know to, to do law uh, or are going to do are are heading to university to do law in the in the new new year academic year or who are thinking to do it in the next couple of years and i said to them you know that things like netflix must 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 make you stop and think you know if you're going to be a a defense lawyer um so let's uh, well that's that's an hour exactly uh so uh, well done everybody for tuning in and and staying uh staying with it uh as i say we'll do the next next part of that opinion um let's say it's just an article from a uh, from a member of the uh, northwestern university which of course is where steve drizzen and laura nyrider are uh, are based as well so uh well, we'll um, look forward to having your company um, in the not too distant future. Um, as I say, in the, in the meantime, I've got a couple of other things that uh, that I work on, and um, we'll catch you again soon. Thanks for tuning in. As I say, do check out the Brandon Brandon Maddox T-shirts. Um, and you, who knows? Maybe, maybe the next time you see me here. I better clear off next time. Maybe I, I will find his black label whiskey. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers.